I was going to say, to some degree, um, this makes me think that uh, that aquatic animals um, never seem to have gotten too far intellectually, at least fish, until mammals. And then the mammals that went back that were land mammals and then went back to the sea were smarter. These are the ones that Sarah's going to talk about. Um, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, gravity is more important than we think. When I look at the history of the brain and what it took for seagoing fish to move onto land and to master terrestrial land and, of course, gravity, a good deal of the brain is actually a product of that evolutionary move. And in many ways, there may be some deep truths to what you're saying. You'll be pleased to know that James Brown agrees with you. James Brown. <laughs> Well, there you G -R -A -B -I -T -Y. go. G-R-A-B-I-T-Y. We'll sample that for you. <laughs> OK. Uh, next speaker is Sarah Waller, professor of philosophy. And uh, it's your, you have the final word. OK. Um, I'll try to make it uh, fairly brief. I'm actually not going to talk about marine mammals tonight. I thought I'd stretch a little bit. And uh, while I won't contest the claim that bonobos can't swing, um, I am going to surprisingly give a bit of a controversial paper. I didn't realize it was controversial when I was finishing up this morning, but I'm going to make the claim that uh, the old mirror experiments, remember those old mirror experiments where chimpanzees were recognizing themselves and so on, actually give us some pretty good information about primate memory and notions of time, which is not how we usually measure primate memory and notions of time. And I'm going to kind of push the thesis that they might have something that looks a lot like episodic memory. So this might be the anti-tulving paper here at the end of the night. So I'm going to start in a very strange place. I'm going to start with an ankh. Uh, Anks are not merely symbols of long life, for the word ankh also means mirror and suggests reflective representation of the self, self-understanding, self-knowledge, reflection on how one sees oneself and how other people see you. And so I thought it was very interesting that if we're going to explore the self, that we actually have an old Egyptian word that refers to the self with a long-lived life and a mirror representation. So I thought there was a little theme in the background. So like a good philosopher, or hopefully like a good philosopher, I thought I'd ask everyone in here, what do you think makes you yourself? What do you think makes you yourself? Right? Because as we've seen already today, self has plenty to do with time and plenty to do with memory. So how do we define ourselves? And so you can give these basic answers and they all have something wrong with them. So you might say, well, I'm myself because I look the same as I did yesterday. I have the same form. Um, I identify myself with notions of, of beauty or with having six fingers or with some unique physical attribute or physical form. And of course, there's something wrong with all of these, right? Um, you could change in form. You could lose a leg or an arm. You could be find that you're composed of different material after you eat a giant burrito, right? You could do all of these things to discover that you're somehow different and so that you can't define yourself in terms of form, in terms of matter, or at least it's not so simple as that. Um, so many people will then say, well, maybe who I am is my personality, my set of reactions to certain things, what I find funny, or my set of beliefs, my set of emotional states, and so on. And of course, that doesn't work either, because we can remember times when we had different beliefs, when we believed in Santa Claus, when we believed that uh, life was different than it is, and so on. Um, we have different personality reactions. There are things that you found funny when you were five that you no longer find funny, probably for most of the people here anyway. So, right, so we have these changes in personality over time. So it seems that personality in and of itself isn't a defining force for what the self is. So, hmm, we get the, uh, the feminist literature. Maybe the self is really about your relationships. Maybe it's about your social role, who you hang around with, who you choose to have as a friend, who you count as family, versus who you don't visit on the holidays, who you may have some vague relationship to. Right? So maybe that's it. But of course, these change all the time, too. Right? People die, uh, people change partners, people lose friends, gain friends, so on and so forth. So who you are as a self can't be simply a matter of social relation either. 
can't be a, me a measure of social role because you can change your job. And yet we, we think that, well, maybe you change a little bit when you change jobs. But there's still the same self that persists through that. It's, it's uh, what uh, Yana was talking about, where there's this subjective, perceived sense of self traveling forward through time. So the self can have many jobs, can have many social roles. Uh, one of my favorite theories of self is called the closest continuer view. It's Robert Nozick's view. And it's just wonderful because it takes all these different axes, you know, what you look like and who you're married to and, and all of these different axes and puts it together and says, you are, as you move forward into the future, exactly the same thing, uh, the close, next closest thing to what you just were. Right, so it's the closest continuer on all of the different axes. And that's what makes you, you. But of course, one of the questions you can ask with that view, which I think is a pretty good one, is by what point of view? According to whose memory? By what perspective? It still seems like you need a you in there remembering where you were on all of these different axes in order to determine what you are going to be. Right, what you are in the next moment. So it seems like memory plays an incredibly important role in our sense of self. And because memory is memory of time past, it's memory of our episodic events, this is how we construct the self, time has everything to do with the notion of self as well. So where am I? Ah, Locke had similar ideas when he talked about the sense of self. So he doesn't disagree at all. He claims that we are unified selves because we have a consciousness that's looking back and unifying all of these events, that's remembering and knitting together things that we've experienced. And that's how we hold ourselves together through a series of memories. So you can see he's got kind of this long definition here of how it is that we remain the same. It boils down to memory. And of course, he gets a little bit worried. Philosophers are supposed to be worried about these things. And he does notice that, you know, we do forget sometimes. And so that's a concern, right? If you're going to construct yourself out of your memories and then you forget some of the things that happened to you, what happens to your constructive self? So, you know, there's still some concern here, but he's definitely showing us that it seems like a memory needs to be in any concept of self you have. And if you go back to the concepts of self I talked about, right, whether it's your form, the material you're made of, your personality, whatever memory seems to underlie all of these things. So given that as sort of the baseline for a human notion of self, what do I want to say? Yes. Let's talk about how we figure out how we conceive of time. Right? So I'm looking at methods, and I'm just giving you a very quick list of methods. There are cognitive scientists in here who have done some of these experiments, I'm sure. So I'm just mentioning them very briefly so that we get sort of a bird's eye view of what the methods that we use are. What do we do? We look at how people keep rhythm. We look at how they keep to the beat. We look at our circadian rhythms. We look at isocods and the timing of isocods in order to try to figure out how it is that human beings keep time and measure time cognitively. We look at priming. We look at reaction time. We look at duration estimation. And we've learned that right attention means much more than arousal when we're trying to estimate how long uh, something lasts. Uh, we know that people who suffer from disintegrative identity disorder and schizophrenia seem to have some sort of disruption when it comes to measuring time or keeping time. Maybe there's a problem in the orbital frontal cortex. Maybe there are problems other places. But what you've got is a disruption in time for all of these. So we know how we measure time. And we know that ultimately what we're doing is going on how people report time duration, how people describe how time occurs to them, and then how they react. So we have a nice direct system for measuring how people perceive and conceive of time. Primates have a more difficult matter in this case, right? It's, we can't ask them about time flying in the lab. We can't go up even to Kanzi or to Coco or some of these primates who, are, who uh, seem to be able to use symbols to talk to us in one way or another. And we can't say, so did time fly when we were doing that experiment? Were you having a good time? Did it seem to drag on? Right. So, so we have to go more oblique when we try to measure 
uh, what their subjective experiences of time are. And most of the experiments that I've found in the literature, and I'm sure I've left out someone's favorite experiment somewhere, but most of the experiments I found don't approach actual timing when they try to address primate notions of time. They actually address primate notions of number, of course. And they can't dance. So we have this extra problem that Perot brought up. It's so like, why do we think that number is so connected to primate notions of time? And we have fabulous experiments. I mean, they're fascinating to go through when you see the, the chimps adding up uh, Mickey Mouse dolls that have been presented on stage and then hidden. And the, you know, they, have, they won't get a reward unless they give you the right answer, and so on and so forth. And you get bonobos subtracting and all these wonderful things. Or you can go into the brain and do some wet work and find that neuronal firing in primates is often interval dependent, so we have time this way. But never do we have this sort of subjective sense of time in primate experiments, not that I've found anyway. So I was struck by how indirect these measures are. It seems like we are not getting to this lived experience, this phenomenal sense of self as a self traveling through time when we're looking at primates. So that's why I'm hoping to suggest that these mirror experiments might give us something a little bit better. All right. Oh, very, very quickly. Because we are going obliquely from primate uh, addition, subtraction, mathematical ability to primate notions of time, I thought, well, maybe Kant can save us. If anybody is a fan of Kant and transcendental idealism, he does say that the reason why we uh, have number at all is because we have you know, this lovely, innate, built-in intuition of time. So as long as we can prove that transcendental idealism is true and everything else is false, then we have a good justificational leg to stand on. I'm not sure that I'm going to do that tonight. But uh, you know, that's one way that we can go with this. Human memory experiments. I'm just trying to sketch out the same thing here. We have a very different approach when we try to look at human memory than when we try to look at primate memory just in general, right? And this is all familiar to everyone who has done psychology and cognitive science. What do we do when we measure human memory? Oh, we give you a list of words and then we ask you to spit it back, right? Or we show you beads on a stick. And then we say, OK, build the same pattern of beads. Right? We do all of these things to try to get the person to reconstruct, to uh, show back to us what they've seen. Uh, we know all sorts of wonderful things. We know about chunking. We know about uh, motor memory. We know that we can influence memories and have false memories. We know all sorts of things about human memory. But we know it, again, through these much more direct methods, because we have semantic access to human beings. We can ask them what they remember. We can ask them to write it down. We can ask them to draw it. We can ask them to reconstruct it. So much more direct. What are we going to do with primates? Well, we, know, we do know a little bit about primate memory because we know that they learn symbols. We know that they learn lex lexicons. Uh, we know that Coco did pretty well with the sign language, if you remember the Patterson experiments. We know that Kanzi did very well, the bonobo with the symbol board. Um, so he's still putting symbols together and communicating away. So he can remember that symbols stand for things and that if you put symbols together, he can get those things or ask people to do things. So fantastic. Franz de Waal, uh, out uh, in the wild studying a variety of different primates, he does a bunch of different creatures, uh, noticed that there's a calculated reciprocity when uh, different non-human primates are interacting with each other. So in other words, they're not completely altruistic and they're not completely egoistic. They will groom those who uh, have groomed them in the fairly recent past. So it seems like they're remembering who's who and who is nice to them and who it's going to pay off to be nice to. So that's a pretty sophisticated uh, window into their memories. right? So we do have something and we do have uh, probably a little bit more anecdotal than really strict uh, scientific evidence about episodic mem memory from Sue Savage, Rumbaugh, and so on, where you have uh, Kanzi seeming to react to a picture that she gives him that looks like the place where they went for a walk, and so on and so forth. So you get some suggestion of episodic, episodic memory. One of my concerns as a philosopher about this kind of data is that it seems like if you are going to take a primate and put it in a lab and test its memory, 
you have a structure. And that structure is that you will reward the primate for remembering something, right? Time delay experiments, um, whatever you have, some sort of planning. So what you're relying on is that the primate will remember that you are going to reward it at the end of the experiment. So you're already relying on this notion that the primate is going to remember and cooperate. So we're assuming the thing that we're trying to test for. So that got me worried. And I thought, gosh, there's got to be another way to approach this where we're not just directly begging the question, right? So then I thought, well, maybe it's already been done. And here's where I'm going to get more suggestive. I'm not sure that this is the case. But it seems like mirror experiments might give us a window into the way that primates remember the world, and maybe even a window into episodic memory. So you have your typical mirror experiments. We know that orangutans do very well. We know that chimpanzees do very well. We know that bonobos do very well. And we have some evidence that some gorillas who have been hand raised and so on do very well. Um, and other gorillas who have not been exposed to a lot of mirrors don't do so well. So that's sort of a maybe. So what is a mirror experiment? Well, basically, you have a primate in an environment. You bring them a mirror. And you bring it to them two or three times. And it's usually on the third time or the fourth time that the experiment actually begins. So you bring them a mirror, and you just sort of let them play with it, interact with it, so on and so forth. And then you say, well, how do they respond to seeing their images in a mirror? And so we've got some great pictures. The pictures are from Tomasello and Call, but I thought that they were helpful. You have uh, the, the wonderful chimpanzee nose picking in the mirror and uh, looking at the tongue. right? And so this is the kind of data that you're, you're getting where you're gathering, hmm, are they examining themselves in the mirror? Are they treating the mirror as if it's an image of them rather than as something else? Now, DeWald just put a paper out about uh, capuchin monkeys uh, saying that they don't really practice this uh, self-examination. You can really see that they're getting into their faces there. They're really looking at something. Capuchins don't quite do that. They seem to do something in the middle where they will go up and kind of look at their reflection. And then the males will get very upset and either attack or back away. And the females will kind of preen a little bit. And, and he described it as flirting, that they will flirt with each other, with their, their reflection in the mirror. So they spend more time looking at their reflections than they would at looking at another uh, capuchin monkey. But they don't preen the way chimps do. Chimps really get in there. And if you put a little mark on the forehead or a mark on the face, they, I believe that the original experiments were actually done with lipstick, which I just think is a wonderful way to you know, multitask in the lab. Right? It's like, oh, lipstick, OK, put some on the, the subject and let them go. Right, And chimps will really get in there. And they try to rub it off. And they're astounded that there's something on the face. Capuchins don't do that. So they seem to be somewhere in between. We can speculate on what exactly is going on with their memories. Um, but what you do have right, is, is when they are responding in the mirror, they are preening themselves. They are responding to that reflection as if it is them and not another monkey. So you got another picture. Is he aware? So there are two interpretations of these mirror experiments, the robust and the weaker interpretation. And the weaker interpretation is probably the more well-received as doing a little bit less reading in, being a little bit more scientific. But let me just walk you through. right? So a robust interpretation of this sort of self increase in self-preening behavior when confronted with a mirror is that the chimps and so on have an idea of me. Wow, an idea of me. That's pretty heavy, right? That sounds like an idea of me moving through time with a personal history, with a sense of self, understanding that I have a physical self that is represented in a mirror, right? That's, that's quite a bit of mental work. That's quite abstract. And then some, some theorists have suggested that this leads to right, understanding the self as a self with feelings. And so understanding other selves as selves with feelings, so having empathy for other beings and having a theory of mind. So believing that other beings have beliefs and emotions and mental lives that can then be 
deceived or manipulated and so on, and pretty soon you're doing politics in the chimpanzee world. So that, there's your robust interpretation. The weak interpretation is called the kinesthetic visual matching theory. And what you have on the weak interpretation is basically like, well, OK, sure. You have a creature. It's presented with its image in the mirror. And it moves, and the image moves. And it kind of figures out, it feels itself, right? Just in, the, in this felt sort of phenomenal reality, it feels itself move. It sees the image move. And it figures out at a very, very basic level that the image is a reflection. So it doesn't have a robust sense of self. It doesn't have empathy. It doesn't have theory of mind. It just recognizes that, that there's corresponding movement when it moves. And it feels itself right press up against the glass. And it sees the mirror hand come up and press up against the glass. And so it says, oh, OK, well, this is something that somehow reflects me. Perhaps perhaps like a standing pool of water, but the me is not robust or well understood, and it doesn't lead to anything else. Also, usually on the weak interpretation, little memory is imported into this theory. Because what do you need memory for? You move, the mirror image moves. You don't have to remember that you're you. Right? You don't have to remember anything. You have constant feedback and stimuli saying that uh, you know, here it is right here. You can just respond to it. You can inspect yourself if you want to. You can flirt with yourself if you want to. And then you, know, you don't necessarily have to remember the episode. But here's where I'm going to mix it up. Um, talked about that already. It seems like this cross-modal interpretation, I'm just going to cut to the chase. It seems like even on the weak interpretation, what you have is a lot of memory action going on. It's not just the case that you have immediate feedback where you move, the mirror image moves, you have immediate kinesthetic feedback, you have immediate visual feedback. First of all, none of these experiments go live until the mirror has been in the enclosure three times. What that means is that the first two times, they weren't getting any data. Why weren't they getting any data? Well, because the mirror was being explored. Because the chimps or choose your primate who successfully completes this are looking at the mirror, throwing it around, using it to hit each other, leaving it alone, being disinterested, breaking it. Right? You're doing all the things that you do before you get ready to complete your experiment. And in that time, I'm willing to wager that something happens where one of the creatures looks in the mirror and sees itself rather than sees it as an object to club someone else with or an object to break or so on and so forth, or just sees motion. Right? If you've seen um, other creatures in the mirror, I've had um, cats be frightened the first time they look in the mirror. They think it's another cat, and they, they get all big and hiss and run away. Right? So they think it's actually something else. So you have to get through all of that. It's not, it's not a beating stick. It's not another creature. It's a reflection. And that comes with a couple of episodes with the mirror, where they're learning what the mirror is and how it responds to them. So by the third time when the experiment goes live, you go, oh, look, we're getting all this great data. And they're preening, and they're looking at their teeth, because they have learned what a mirror is through episodic use of the mirror. Now, this doesn't have to be heavy or robust, but it does show that they have learned something about the mirror. And so there is a memory of the mirror and themselves being reflected in it. So they have to remember to look in the mirror rather than to look at the side or something else. And then they have to remember to see in a certain way. Um, certainly, maybe the first time that you saw a Necker cube, it looked flat. What's a Necker cube? Ah, I don't have a blackboard. Um, Mark is making. It's a two dimensional uh, right. figure that can be perceived in three dimensions Thank as you. having um, either one vertex forward and the uh, Y axis or the other vertex uh, forward and the Y axis. You can perceive one, the cube one way or the other way, but not both simultaneously. Okay, bravo. Yay, thank you, Max. Awesome picture of a Necker cube, right? So, so you may have to learn how to see that as three-dimensional the first time you do it. But then once you do it, boom, you've got the illusion and you're good to go. Um, also, I've had people tell me about maybe when you were young and you were first watching television, have you ever fallen out of the picture? 
of the television, right? So it's like, oh, suddenly I'm not involved in the action anymore, and it seems like a box with a lot of motion going on. And then you can ease yourself back into the action, right? So Todd, at least, has had this experience. I, yeah, you know, it happens to me occasionally, right? So there's a certain amount of not only remembering to use the mirror as a mirror and to look at the mirror, but to see the mirror in a certain way. So I think that there's actually a lot of episodic memory going on there. So that's my contentious claim for the evening. I'm all done. Thank you. I have self awareness. As it were, to use a metaphor. Um, a spatial metaphor. Well, I, I have to say that um, maybe your claim is not as contentious as it sounds. Um, oh, good. Andel Tolving's original theory of episodic memory is fairly compatible with what you've said. That is, he, in his early theory in the elements of episodic memory, <clears throat> and, and this is testified by the big exchange in the behavioral and brain sciences about 1984 on, on his book, um, David Olton, who's a comparative researcher, made the argument that uh, some primates and, and other species uh, showed evidence of having a memory for specific episodes that was very, very had contained a lot of very particular memories. And um, that, and, and Tolving at that time agreed with that, and then he changed it. <clears throat> and the reason he changed it was KC, the case of KC that was brought up earlier. Um, he, that, because KC lost not only uh, his episodic memory of immediate past things, but of all episodic memories throughout his entire life, <clears throat> and that one turned it around because conventional studies of episodic amnesia didn't convince him of this, but this one did. So he changed his theory. But I've, I've told him many times that I agreed with his first theory, not his second theory. So I mean, I, I completely agree with, uh, with what you're saying, that uh, there's very good evidence for episodic recall in, in, um, in various uh, primates and possibly other social mammals as well. Um, but I wanted, uh, um, I did, that's just a comment, uh, but I want to open the floor here. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> this is, the, 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 the methodology is very interesting, as, and, and we know elephants do it as well since last summer. And, and in, dolphins. In Brook and the bottlenoses. But one of the things that strikes me about this is when you compare it to infants uh, or young children, the, the, what you haven't got in is, is that transition from singularity of point of view to multiple. Because one of the things that the infants very quickly do once they've gone through these is that they show signs of being aware of approving or disapproving of what they see, which the chimp never does. Right. So they begin to turn around to mm -hmm. see what another will, will, will think of their own appearance. Mm -hmm. Which suggests that Catherine Nelson's idea is that they are beginning to build multiple perspectives which they can occupy including, you know, in this case, whoever's behind them. Yeah, Are the they shared gaze, yes. right? Yeah. Um, yes, and I wish that I could tell you all about uh, dolphins sharing gaze, uh, but I can't, and they probably don't share gaze, but they may, uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that they share um, echolocation bounce back. Um, so one will echolocate for the entire group, and everyone seems to be navigating based on that, so they have a good awareness, so maybe there's some sort of shared audition. Yes? Yeah. It's, uh, when I watch my dog dream, and she's hooting and obviously on the chase, is that a form of episodic memory in an animal? I mean, she's well, I mean, we've, we've definitely talked about the similarity between memory and imagination, and dreams are, I would say, more like imaginative constructs, though they use elements of memory throughout. So maybe some blend <laughs> of all of these things. I don't want to just say it's a memory, um, only based on my own dreams, right? I really have no idea what's going on in a doggy dream, but my dreams are constructs of memories and other wild things that are going on. So I imagine that there are elements of all of those, but that's, that's my imagination about doggy dreams. So. <laughs> uh, I, I started out uh, about to ask this question uh, thinking that we'd been doing one thing, and then I sort of changed uh, my mind. So let me, let me phrase it this way. We did some experiments. One, uh, we, we did a study one time, and it was a, it was a group of uh, people working in a large open office, and they were doing software development. 
And so one of the things that we noticed, uh, we were comparing them to people who were working in their own offices in a sort of a regular type of building. One of the things we noticed was that they, they would move things around depending on what they were doing. And we, and we kept track of what they were doing and what they did with the things. So I, I would put a, a whiteboard up along here. And uh, when I was doing certain things, or I would go into a corner and I would pull a drape, but I, and, or I'd pull it a little, or I'd pull it a lot, or you know these various kinds of things. And we were thinking that it was about time and that they were shaping huh. space to compensate for uh, their experience of time. And what we did was show that the kinds of things they were doing when they closed their space off uh, were, were difficult programming tasks. And when they allowed open, more open space, they were doing um, things that were not so critical and, let's say, mentally taxing. Mm -hmm. So that got me thinking at first, could there be something similar with primates? Do they shape their spaces? And might it have something to do with time? That's one part of the question. The other part is, maybe we were just uh, being very metaphoric, thinking these people were arranging time, let's say, experiencing time by shaping their space. Because it could just be level of difficulty. And that I know that I, I shut the door to my office when I'm actually trying to produce something, and I open the door when I want to be distracted by others. So, um, But <laughs> let me try to answer your question. Uh, we know that primates spontaneously, and I mean, I'm speaking generally. Let's talk about chimps. Uh, they will move things around in their environment whether there's a prize to be had or not. So it seems like they're just manipulative creatures. Um, if you put, everyone knows the famous experiments where you hang the banana and then, right, it's like, oh, okay, so we'll give them a stick and we'll give them a bunch of boxes and so on and so forth and we'll see if they can figure out to get to the bananas. And of course they can and hurrah and they're very smart and all that. Except for if you take the bananas away, they they will do this. They will still stack the boxes and wave the stick around. So apparently it is just intrinsically in interesting, if I can read in again liberally as to their mental states, to stack boxes and wave sticks around. But then if you think about any sort of operant conditioning at all for any creature, right? If you, if you train a creature that if it does something, you're going to give it a reward, whether it's a person or a rat, they're going to be more active. They're going to do things because they, they've got it programmed in that, oh, I'm going to get a reward if I'm active, if I do something. So if I move the chairs around, maybe uh, I'll get a raise. Or maybe I'll look very busy and uh, you know evade the boss, maybe, right? So it could be that we're, we're prone in this culture, right? We have sort of an operant conditioning culture where the more things you do, right, and the more creative things that you do, the more likely you are to get some sort of reward or other. So maybe we're all just operant creatures running around, uh, rewards seeking and, and maybe that's what they were doing and maybe that's what the chimps are doing. Maybe that's a primate trait. Well, I think I, I'm not 100% convinced that you answered his basic question, though. Okay. Well, I think, I think I, I, what she said was that we got it wrong, that it wasn't really about time. I, I'm, that that I rearranging yeah. their space was not necessarily about time. I don't but see it made for a very interesting paper. Me. <laughs> that, that it was about time. But maybe I'm missing a little piece of your experiment that would show me that it was about time. But it, it seems like there are other explanations yes. that, yeah. that yeah. go equally as well for just moving the environment around. So that's why I didn't answer Maybe we question. should use the word time <laughs> management instead. <laughs> something, something like that. <clears throat> um, other questions at this point? Uh, now, I, is, where did Mark go? He's vanished for a moment. He'll be back. <laughs> <clears throat> um, well, I had uh, I had some other questions that uh, were unanswered, at least at this point, um, that had to do more with uh, uh, the question of an old-fashioned physiological question, <clears throat> and you know the 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 very conservative interpretation that you gave, where the, all they were doing was um, noticing the the concurrence or the correlation between their movements and the movements in the mirror. Now that, of course, makes you think of what's called reafference in physiology. And reafference is an inferred process that was uh, first observed in the 19th century and then confirmed uh, physiologically, which is that when you initiate, the difference between you initiating a movement 
and your arm being passively moved by somebody else, for example, by grabbing your arm, <clears throat> is that when you initiate the movement, you, your motor brain sends out a signal that's called reafference, which uh, correlates perfectly with your actual produced movement, whereas if you're passively moved, the reafference signal is not there because you didn't initiate it. So, and in fact, reafference outputs have been observed from the, from the motor brain. Uh, but many, many animals have reafference signals. Reafference is based, basically built right into all motor systems, uh, certainly all terrestrial motor systems and, and avian motor systems. So, <clears throat> so um, I don't buy into the reafference. Uh, what, what you're putting down as the ultra-conservative interpretation is basically that since there's a kind of, of correlation between your movement and the movement that you see, that it's essentially equivalent to reafference in your in your own body, and, and um, in that case, many many other species should be able to do the task, and they don't. And so I think that strengthens your interpretation. That is, uh, you know, the the more robust interpretation, because the uh, reafference signal alone wouldn't do it. So um, just a, just an observation. There does seem to be a bit of seeing <coughs> as involved yes. with, with the mirror experiments. Yes. There was that controversy where um, someone trained a pigeon to do quite well in the mirror, but it had to do with pecking dots on the mirror and then pecking dots on itself and then rewarding it every time it pecked yeah, a dot. No. So then it would, so then it appeared to preen itself in the mirror and examine the new dots and all of that because it had been rewarded. So. Yes, yeah, Skinner used to have a demonstration that he did in class. You know, he would have pigeon in a cage, and while he lectured, a program was reinforcing the pigeon so that at the end of the lecture, uh, it would <clears throat> respond to a little card saying, spin right by spinning to the right, spin left by spinning to the left. And he said, well, I'm teaching the pigeon how to read while, you, while the class is going on. It's just, but of course, it, it takes thousands of trials. It's very specific. It doesn't generalize, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't really imply that at all. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of illusion involved in conditioning. Um, in fact, uh, uh, they were very much aware of that, of course, uh, when they did that. But in any case, um, I think that uh, the night is wearing on here. And, and uh, uh, I'd ask, OK, one more question, and then I'm going to ask Mark to close uh, out the session. Very short. Of course. Of course. One point that uh, seems to be uh, predominant in uh, human memory recollection and uh, emotional display in uh, relation to, to the past is proper names that have to do with persons that are singular and that we um, um, like uh, connect to with some sort of passionate affection of some kind. And um, they seem to be... Uh, uh, we think that, that uh, persons with proper names know their proper names and that we can connect to them by activating that proper name, etc. It, it, by the way, it's extended to places that have proper names and it's extended to proper names for slots in time. Otherwise, calendars would again be impossible. Um, now, in uh, animal uh, cognition, do, for example, uh, domesticated dogs uh, know that they have names. When we uh, teach them uh, those names by passionate affection, or what happens? I'm not going to answer your question for dogs, but I am going to answer it for dolphins, because I just gave a paper on this, and there is fascinating research on dolphin signature whistles, right? So each individual bottlenose dolphin does have a whistle that is very specific and distinct and persists over time. And uh, there have been recordings of mothers uh, using their son's specific signature whistle after they've been gone for three years, traveling up and down the coast. Uh, son will recognize mom, mom will recognize son. Um, the daughter's signature whistles are very, very different from the mother's signature whistles, which seems to uh, facilitate their social lives because the daughters live with the mother for most of their lives in a, in a pod, right? So. You have what looks like a name-like phenomenon in uh, dolphin research. And the, the most recent research has just come out that males, males will pair bond. It's not males and females. Ma males will pair up and swim up and down the coast courting females. And what, what's been found is that their signature whistles will converge. And they will start to have like one whistle that both of them will use that's some combination of the two whistles.
So it's, it's marriage. Changing. It is. It's changing your name with, to merge with your partner. <laughs> so very interesting stuff. And, and I do think that there's a lot of philosophy that can be done about is that a name? Is it a face? You know, what sort of recognition value does that have and identification value? And how does that change how they think about themselves if they change their names to be members of a group and so on? So, but dogs, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, on that basis, I thank the speaker very much for a very kind